Hello and welcome to the Modern Digital Enterprise, the digital transformation podcast from Annexinet. Today we'll be talking about trends in modern enterprise architecture. Annexinet General Manager and Executive VP Al Sporer will be our guest host. So without further ado, take it away, Al. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we're going to be talking about one of our favorite topics, modern enterprise architecture and why it's so important to your digital transformation. I'm Al Spohr. I'm the Executive Vice President and General Manager of Annexinet Digital. And on the microcast with me is Steve Tranchita. Steve, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, Al. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I've been in the IT industry for almost 30 years, and um, I kind of went through a lot of years as a software developer uh, to then getting into a lot of enterprise architecture work and helping clients really transform their enterprise architectures that's driving their application portfolio. And uh, today, uh, I head up our enterprise architecture group at Annexnet. We help uh, a lot of different clients with introducing kind of new ways of doing things and new uh, architectures for the digital era. Great. Thanks, Steve. And also with us on the line today is David Lavin, one of our senior enterprise architects. David, do you want to give your quick introduction? Sure. You know, I've been doing uh, IT for about 25 or so years, really for the past 15 or so. I've been working kind of in the discipline of enterprise architecture versus enterprise architect and then uh, leading enterprise architecture groups for, for several companies. Um, it's definitely a kind of a passion area of mine, and I'm excited to talk about it. Awesome. Thanks guys for joining. So let's start out. So we're going to talk about modern enterprise architecture. So I'll just throw it over to you guys. What is a modern enterprise architecture? And Steve, I guess I'll start with you. Sounds a little bit buzzwordy. I'll, I'll give the audience that. But the demands on systems today continue to evolve and, and increase dramatically. And so um, when we want to build great customer experiences to allow our customers to self-service, when we want to empower our employees with the best tools so that they can do their jobs and they can, they can serve customers better. All of that is powered by kind of the core technical ecosystem that we establish at our companies. And so EA Modernization is all about making sure that your core foundation of your technology ecosystem, the things that are powering your digital systems, is designed and built in such a way that enables great experiences, empowered employees, and great customers. In order to do that today, you can't think and do things the same way as we did them at the turn of the century, right? Technology has evolved, techniques have evolved, and so it's about injecting new ways of thinking into that foundational piece of IT. Great. Thanks, Steve. What are two of the most common trends that you see our clients and our customers asking us about around modern architecture today? For the most part, a lot of the questions kind of come around the goals that people are trying to reach with their enterprise architecture today. Steve was talking about, you know, as things are changing, you know, enterprise architecture for a while was, it was focusing on new channels of delivery and then the scale of some of those channels, cost reduction. I think really the last few years, it's, it's pivoted more towards agility because things are changing so fast. You know, they, they need an architecture that's built in such a way that they can adapt easily. So as part of that, I think a lot of people are moving towards, um, you know, they're taking the kind of the service-oriented architectures that they've been working on really for the past 10 years and had, you know, maybe even in some cases limited success with, and they're, and they're trying to adapt them into that kind of adaptability. And that's where, you know, the trend around microservices has really started to take off. And, and there's been a lot of kind of technology platforms that are enabling that. And then second, I would say is, as they start to build out these services and they start to have the difficulty to kind of orchestrate those things together, really the idea of event-driven architecture and the, the ability to take a kind of a business-centric view to, to the events that happen in an enterprise and, and kind of string all these microservices together and restring them as needed to kind of adapt to the changing business landscapes. So I think that's kind of the second real important one that's happening now. Great. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. So. We've heard about microservices, I think, for, in, in my estimation, for probably at least five years. And probably the number one question that I hear, both from when I came from a tool vendor side of the house to today where we actually build uh, applications, is, is how do I get started? So, Steve, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, what are some common tips that you would say? Like, how do you get started on the microservice journey and, and, and where do you look? 
what you don't do is you don't you don't say, "Ooh, microservices." That sounds that sounds like it's going to solve all my problems. <laughs> um, you you kind of have to start where you always start in IT, which is what what are the business goals I'm trying to achieve, right? And how do I then apply architectural patterns that are going to best achieve those objectives? So it's not a panacea for everybody. It's a way to achieve certain business objectives. And in microservices, that's all about getting the ability to release faster, release more incrementally and continuously roll out software in faster increments. So it's really about independent deployability of smaller components. And that allows you to increase your agility and velocity, uh, which is really what the game is all about in, in today's digital era, Al. Great. Thanks, Steve. So David, you've been deploying these architectures both as a client and as a consultant over the last several years. So what are the couple tips that you have on how you've gotten started and, and where you picked to start? So I think there's a few things. I think Steve was talking about the, you know, the business context for this architecture pattern. I think it really does, especially in, in a more formal enterprise architecture approach, it, it really is starting to leverage some of the business architecture aspects that, that many EA teams have been looking at over the past few years and, and the importance of those and understanding business capabilities and be able to kind of take those things apart and to break them up into their smaller kind of bits and bytes of, of, of how things operate. From there, it's, a lot of it is also around understanding how the journey on microservices also touches the other aspects that are going on within IT, a lot of the other trends. So when you talk about things like DevOps or some of the next-gen infrastructure around containerizations or, or platforms as service and those kinds of things, those go hand in hand with the microservices journey because it's very hard to get the benefits that Steve was talking about with the rapid deployment if you don't have some of those underlying infrastructure and development process capabilities. So the other thing I would say is that those things all go hand in hand and, and it is about making sure that you're kind of running those, those journeys in sync with each other. So when you think about deploying, and so that, that's how you get started, but when you actually run into the challenge of actually trying to get something in production, I, I think most of our clients and most of us live in this gray world where it'd be great if we could start from the ground up and build our applications and our infrastructures with, I would say, modern patterns in, in mind. But most of our clients are, are dealing with legacy infrastructure, dealing with legacy data. Can you guys talk a little bit about some of the I'll call them opportunities that you guys see um, as you get started and where you can actually, I'll, I'll say, hit some low-hanging fruit and get past some of the challenges that you see in, in the legacy infrastructure where you're trying to modernize and, and build an agile, rapid application environment? I can uh, jump in first there, Alan. And, and you're right. Uh, most organizations don't have the luxury that a Silicon Valley startup has, right? Where you're starting with a clean sheet of paper and you can architect whatever you want. Most organizations have a lot of complex systems already in place and, and it's really gonna end up being a gradual transformation. And so the, the key is how do you define that gradual transformation? I think it starts with honestly looking at what you have today, your infrastructure in place today and saying, where, where truly are my monoliths and categorizing and identifying those monoliths. And then once you've identified what, what you think are monoliths, the question then becomes, how do I gradually take apart this monolith and build more of a microservices based architecture based on smaller, more well-defined business domains? And, and it's typically not going to be a big bang approach. You're typically not going to rewrite an entire ERP system all at once, you're going to do it in pieces by gradually phasing in um, certain microservices. So the magic, Al, is, is how do you define those phases? And, and there's an analysis that has to happen, really, where you're looking at both you know, kind of ease of decoupling certain business domains of a monolith versus the business benefits that you're going to get by modernizing into a microservices architecture for that business domain function. And you try to take kind of where does that intersection look like it's maximizing both sides of, you know, the X and Y graph. And, you know, things start to emerge where say, you know, these look like the domains I should probably tackle first. Great, Steve. So, David, any, um, any wisdom that you have? And, and especially, I would say, since you've had practical application of doing this over many, many years, any of the challenges that you see as far as decoupling the monolith? 
couple things. One, I would also say that, you know, folks that are coming from microservices from a very kind of academic approach, kind of understanding that a lot of the classic definitions of our microservices aren't as applicable to large companies that have legacy, especially around how they manage data. So understanding that, you know, there's a spectrum to the kind of the granularity of the services, especially around the data. And there's even people that talk about mini services and, and meaning kind of a little more of a hybrid approach. The other thing I would say is to, to, to recognize as you go through the transition, your, your systems are going to coexist with each other. And so there's, there's several different patterns and approaches that you can implement in order to facilitate that transition, um, you know, put up facades of certain types and things like that. So you can start to disconnect the legacy from everything else and, and start to do that transition to microservices. But you're going to have replicated data initially. You're going to have to have some kind of event hub passing data back and forth between the microservices kind of architecture sphere and the, and the legacy application. So, you know, expect that that transition is going to, there's going to be many approaches you have to take during that transition to make it work. Um, your vision is, is still the same, but that transition state is going to take some time. I mean, years really. And you're going to have to have architecture patterns that help you kind of bridge the gap between those two worlds until you can finally kind of finish that journey. Great. Thanks, David. David, you talk about transitioning and transitional state. So, you know, I came from a tool vendor. A lot of the tool vendors will say, hey, just buy my tool, buy my API gateway, buy my ESB, and everything will be fine. So can you talk about, you know, is it just buying a tool? to transition you from your legacy to the modern, or are there other steps that you have to really go through? Well, I mean, there's definitely other steps because no, no tool set, especially one that's built just to deploy something as kind of low level as microservices isn't going to solve your business problems for you. They're not gonna lead you down the right solution to how you decompose all your data services and business process services in the right way so that they're you know, recombinable and, and, and adaptable. From a technology set, as, as you're looking at it, I mean, keep in mind, there's, there's really two aspects to what you're looking to lay out. I mean, you need to figure out what's typically called the, the inner architecture of the services. This is how you're going to build and, and deploy each individual service and, and what that looks like. But then also working out your outer service uh, architecture, which is where you get into things like API gateways and, and maybe a service bus and, and, and things like that. And definitely the, the, the tools that are available to varying degrees can, can help um, you land on the right architectures for that, D- depending on how, obviously, how much you want to invest in any single technology stack. You know, a lot of folks that are going microservices are also leaning more towards, you know, how do I stay independent? Um, how do I make sure I'm not having vendor lock-in and, and, and whatnot? And that's, that can be difficult because, especially when you're talking about, for instance, the cloud platforms, a lot of the choices you'll be making are, you know, how far down this path do I want to go? Because there's, there's offerings that are very kind of managed service platforms. So really you're just coding the services and, and putting it in the environment and they're figuring out the load balancing and the scaling and all those pieces for you. And that can be great, especially if you don't have a good kind of infrastructure capability to be able to do that for yourself. But you're also very much investing into that, whatever platform that is. And so I think many companies, when they're approaching these vendors, need to you know, think about internally, like, how much do I want to, you know, dedicate my architecture to any one platform? Because there's trade-offs for that. Great. Thanks, David, for that explanation. So it sounds like tools are an important part of the solution, but not everything. And, and you have to take a holistic picture to your environment and how you're going to design that, which leads us to the next topic, which is event-driven. And Steve, do you want to, you know, Give us a little bit more about what is event-driven and how do you couple all these things together? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Event-driven is kind of a, a new emerging pattern. I mean, it, conceptually, it's not new, but as a first-class citizen of an architecture, you know, it's new and, and new technology, Al, has evolved over the last few years. It's technology that's, for example, come out of like the big data space that have enabled new ways of doing event-driven at a massive scale and highly distributed. So that's why it's kind of come back into focus. And, and the business context is this. Every microsecond, there's things happening in my business that 
other pieces of my business or somebody else may want to know about or react to. Like a business is a real-time enterprise by nature. And so the old ways of doing like once a day or once a month gigantic batch jobs, for example, to kind of get all of our data in order just aren't good enough uh, in the digital era. You can't build intelligent applications that are contextual that way. You need real-time data flow across your organization. The event-driven movement is really about enabling real-time data flow at massive scale uh, in a highly distributed fashion throughout your organization. That's kind of the reason for it. And, And as I said, it's coming into focus with some new technologies that have emerged to implement it. Thanks, Steve, for that explanation. So, David, over to you. Um, as a technologist, what, what excites you about event-driven architectures today? And as a practitioner of, of seeing you know, some of these concepts in the past and the ability to execute on them, what do you find compelling about the, this new modern emerging patterns of design? Well, I think that, you know, Steve touched on it, it's, it's the scale. The architecture approach to an event-driven architecture has been around you know, 20 plus years. Anyone who's used any of the old EAI tools, the TIBCOs of the world, MQs, the message driven, it's been there for a long time. And, the, and these patterns have been there, you know, within Gang of Four and other patterns in, in how we build applications for a long time. What's different now is none of those platforms are really able to keep up with the scale, especially today with things like IoT and whatnot, of the events that are happening and the ability to you know, apply real-time analytics to these event streams, you know, and those event streams can be, you know, like I said, IoT data, they can be for, you know, a large insurance company, they can be claims coming in, you know, millions and millions a day that they're running through a, you know, check of thousands of processes and, and, and looking for events off of that. Whatever, whatever the business context is, you know, the, the ability to kind of really rapidly and in real time process those data streams in an event-driven way and, and kind of pull out the business relative events that are hidden within that data and to give them meaning and to, and to use them really to start to drive some, especially some of those microservices we were talking about before, is really what excites me is how, the, how they come together so that you can really have a real-time, you know, enterprise architecture that's, that's flowing off of these data streams that are coming in from, whether from partners, from customers, from equipment, whatever it may be, and you can really kind of harness the value of that data. And you're not waiting to dump it into a big data store somewhere in a dupe, although that's immensely valuable and you can create great analytics out of that, but it's still kind of a tell me what happened kind of approach versus um, your ability to process these data streams turns it into what is happening, how can I adapt faster? Great, thank you. So moving on to, you know, again, like we talked about microservices uh, on where to start. Steve, we've seen a lot of different use cases. I, I think uh, the listeners probably want to know what are some of the best places to start? Is that, and you know, we, we've talked about it before, customer 360 is at event management uh, with a large lot of logs. Where, where are the best places to start when you think about event-driven and, and where I should evaluate it in my infrastructure and my, my architecture? I think it's going to depend on the organization, but there's you know kind of horizontal uh, applications for event driven, which is across systems and across business use cases like customer three hundred and sixty, uh, and then there's business vertical specific use cases like claims processing and things and things of that nature. Thematically, this this ties really well into the prior conversation we had about microservices, in that one of the major themes in modern architecture we're seeing today, Al, is, is about decoupling right, and reducing dependencies. So with event-driven, it's beautiful. Any event of significance that happens in, in your business, you can publish that event, you can broadcast that event f- for anybody who's interested in that event to react to however they deem best. And that, that inherently is loosely coupled. So let's take a use case like Customer 360. I want to build and maintain a complete picture of customer activity with respect to my business. So every kind of interaction or micro interaction or piece of a journey that a customer has, um, I, I want to maintain that in all areas of my business in real time. So if an event happens, like, for example, um, a CRM record is updated, the CRM system doesn't need to know 
every single end system and person that needs to know about that update, it'll simply broadcast, hey, this event took place. The customer has changed an aspect of their profile that you may want to know about. And so I'll issue an event that that occurred. That goes to the event hub. Uh, not only does it get stored there as an immutable piece of data, so a record of the event, but it can then be consumed by listeners um, for, for that event for whatever purposes they want by reacting to that in some way with a, with a reach out or a suggestion or some back office process that has to get initiated downstream, but it's completely decoupled from the front end event that actually happened. So use cases, well, let's look where we need to decouple, you know, areas of our business um, and, and make them less dependent on gigantic system changes. Let's look for areas where real-time data flow could really be a benefit to the business value that system or process is producing. Um, those are all things you know you start to look at when you get into where to start with event-driven use cases. Great, thanks, Steve. So, David, I'm going to ask you a similar question, but more you know, from your background as an EA at a client. When you think about something like event-driven and implementing it, you know, when you think about the challenges of implementing something new and and organizational readiness, can, can you just talk to us a little bit about? maybe some of the obstacles that you would see inside uh, you know, an enterprise architecture group on evaluating some of these new types of technologies or maybe some of these new design patterns? One of them is definitely organizational because when you start to decompose the enterprise architecture in this way and to you know, separate out the, the action from the event, a lot of times that goes against the grain of the kind of the existing application-centric organization structure, especially within the app delivery models. So when you're used to running a big ERP from, a, you know, from one of the big vendors and you have a team that's built around that to say you're going to decompose that and drive this with an event-driven architecture that's on a completely separate platform and then have these independent services that are going to react to that, there's a major shift you have to have in, in how you structure those teams. Because if you don't, you end up with an architecture that, that looks very much like the legacy architecture because that's you know that's just one of the laws of, of how IT works. So I think that's part of it. And then it's for the event driven piece specifically, it also requires you to look at what's happening in the business through that lens. Meaning, you know, you don't look at the events like you would look at the integration that you that needs to happen. So a lot of times if we've been using kind of NQ based uh, or even, you know, TIPCO or whatever to where we're, we're doing data synchronization across applications, that's, you know, was called event driven, you know, 15 years ago. And it was like, oh, this data record changed an event posts here. And then, and then we're going to push that data over to this other system. You're just keeping data in sync. Whereas this event driven architecture is a different kind of thing where you're thinking about business events, not data events. And that's also requires kind of a different skill set and a different understanding of what the business is doing. This isn't a kind of data integration layer kind of approach anymore. It's a rethinking about how your IT systems kind of orchestrate how your business works. And, and that's the other thing too, is, is think of it as a, as, as a business flow rather than a data flow. Great. So to summarize what you guys both just said, you know, it's super important to not just think about the design, the technology piece of this, the organizational readiness, but you also have to really understand your business process, your business, how your business flows to actually effectively design and implement an event-driven architecture, if, if I got that right. Um, and I, I guess we probably should leave it on that point, but how would you guys suggest coupling all three of those things together to get started? To me, again, it goes back to, maybe this is kind of the more formal EA practitioner in me, but I think really understanding your business capabilities and your business architecture is key in any of these decompositions, whether you're going microservices or event-driven or combination of the two, you have to understand what the business is doing and not come at it from a very technology-centric way. You can't say, oh, I'm just going to go to microservices or I'm going to send people to microservices training and learn some kind of platform, whether it's a I don't know, it's a MuleSoft or you're going to use the Azure platform or AWS or whatever it would be. The first step I would say is, is get your functional architecture people, your, your business analysts, your business 
facing IT folks, even some of the folks, if you have product managers within the business, if, you know, if you're, if you're taking more of that kind of agile approach, make sure that they understand the shift here and let them drive from that point down into the technology. Don't start with the technology, start with thinking of the solution in a different way and then letting the technology support that new solution. Great. Thanks. Steve, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think there's core principles that, you know, a modern digital enterprise needs to have today. And and a lot of that evolves around uh, keeping information up to date and available all the time and being very nimble and very agile. And I think sometimes if you just ask an open-ended question that says, hey, how do I get started with event-driven? You can stump some people. But I think if you can look symptomatically at what's holding you back from the core principles I just mentioned, you'll start to see some tangible um, opportunities to attack. So for example, I may have a a web application with uh, a certain feature in it that tends to not work the way the customer would want to work in an optimal way. And people say, well, we had to compromise on that because that data comes from this system over here and uh, we don't have that data until the next morning. Um, it, you know, so if you start to look at areas of frustration, especially in digital interactions, Al, sometimes those, those places where you need to address or get started can quickly you know, start to come flooding at you. And then, and then you can take a step back and say, what are root causes of this? Because that particular use case is in direct violation of a core principle of a modern digital enterprise. And, and the business value that we're trying to give uh, is being held back by this lack of modern architecture. All right, gentlemen, I think that was incredibly informative and I enjoyed the conversation this afternoon. I hope everybody out there listening to this did too. And until next time, thanks for coming, Steve. And thanks for coming, David. Really appreciate it having you on this today and uh, look forward to talking on the next topic very soon. Thanks everybody and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Al. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Modern Digital Enterprise. The Digital Transformation Podcast from Annexinet, part of the Annexinet Podcast Network. Be safe, be healthy. Bye-bye. As a leading technology consultancy and reseller, Annexinet helps clients provide a complete digital experience for customers, employees, and end users. We accomplish this through our holistic approach, which encompasses all aspects of today's digital journey end to end. Annexinet partners with top technology vendors like HPE to offer products and services that enhance the digital experience across customer engagement, enterprise mobility, cloud and hybrid IT, and analytics. Because great digital experiences rely on the smooth operation of all interconnected elements. From strategy through execution, we deliver custom multi-channel applications, including web, mobile, chat, and voice with self-service apps for customer loyalty and enterprise apps that streamline internal processes. Now, you can reimagine legacy applications to propel your business forward. Annexinet also helps you embrace modern cloud and hybrid IT infrastructure to provide a seamless experience at every touchpoint, empowering you to recover quickly from disaster, scale to meet demand, and automate systems for perfect performance 24-7. And to maximize your competitive advantage, we ensure you always deliver the best experience possible by continuously honing your digital solutions through data-driven insights. So, how do you know if your business has what it takes to provide the complete digital experience? One that sets you apart, maintains competitive edge, and turns users into passionate fans? Simple. Just give us a call. Together, we can deepen engagement and make every digital experience remarkable.